In this video, we are going to look at motion in space. So we're going to revisit velocity and acceleration, and we're going to do a little bit of Kepler's law of planetary motion. So up until this point, we've been giving you bits and pieces. Now we're going to bring it all together, which is really what we're trying to do in this chapter is talk about the description of motion along a plane curve, which is in 2D, or in space curves, which is in 3D, like helixes, which is slick, slick stuff. So let's define what we have. Let R be a vector valued function that's twice, twice differentiable. That means I can take the derivative twice. And it is going to represent the position of an object at some time t. Then the velocity is the first derivative of our vectored valued function. The acceleration is the second derivative of the vectored value function, or the first derivative of velocity. And then now we're going to define speed as the magnitude of our velocity vector, which is the first derivative, or derivative of s with respect to t. Now, none of this is really new. It is going to be slightly new in a moment, but this is really nothing new. So, when we are looking at the position in two dimensions, I just have the i and j, and then in three dimensions I have k. The velocity is going to be the derivative of the x part of the um, parametric equation, the y part of the parametric equation. If you have it in three space, of course, we have the z derivative, and then the accelerate, acceleration is the second derivative, is, and the speed is going to be the first derivative of, of each one of them squared, whether you're in two or three space. So if we're asked to find the velocity, acceleration, and speed in terms of the parameter t, I'm not putting it in a, in a t value, so I'm not evaluating at t equals zero, t equals five. I'm just doing the formulas. So the first thing I'm gonna do is find my first derivative, so r prime, because this is my velocity vector. And this is simply gonna be the derivative of cosine, which is negative three sine of t. And then the derivative of sine, which is 3 cosine of t. And then my uh, last one, which is 2t. So this is my velocity vector. Now I want to know the acceleration, which is the second derivative of t, which is the first derivative of my velocity, which is my acceleration. So now I'm going to... Um, Find the second derivative, which is going to give me negative 3 cosine of t. And then I'm going to have a negative 3 sine of t. And then, of course, 2. Now, the speed, v of t, is going to give me... Now, this is not a velocity. These were, velo these were vectors. Excuse me. These were vectors up here. These were all vectors. Now, the, the v of t here is not... A vector, I don't want to get it confused, it's not a vector. It's going to be the square root of the negative 3, the sine of t, the quantity squared, plus 3, the cosine of t, the quantity squared, plus 2t, the quantity squared. Now we know, like we're really familiar with this, we get 9, the sine squared t, plus 9, the cosine squared t, plus 4t squared. We know that these two combined give us 9 times 1 because I can factor out a 9 and I've got sine squared plus cosine squared which is 1 all day long. And so what I end up with is the square root of 9 plus 4t squared. And, and that's as good as it gets. Unless I have a value for t, I'm not going to be able to do anything else to that I can't distribute the square root because it does not distribute over um, addition and subtraction. So that's it. That is as good as that one gets. Now let's go ahead and do the second one. So I have r prime of t, which is the velocity, and this is a vector of t. So I'm going to get the derivative of e to the t. So this is going to be negative e raised to the negative t, plus on the, in the i hat. So let me put my i hat there. i hat plus 2t j hat. And then, of course, we love the derivative of tangent. This is going to be secant squared of t in the k direction. To 
Find the velocity, the acceleration, it's the second derivative of the position vector. These are vectors, which is going to be the first derivative of my velocity vector. That's going to give me my acceleration vector, which is going to give me uh, e, back to e, raised to the negative t in the i direction, plus 2, and then just 2 in the j direction, and then we have to use the chain rule on the secant squared. So this is going to be 2 secant t and not squared anymore. Let me do that not squared anymore. So just secant of t. And then the derivative of secant is secant t tangent of t in the k direction. Now I'm, gonna, I'm just going to clean this up a little bit. e raised to the negative t in the i, 2 in the j plus 2 secant squared t tangent of t in the k direction and you may want to put your angles in parentheses so it doesn't look like taint or something just saying so now we need to find the speed so this is v of t this is not a vector that's why i'm not putting the vector notation over the top of that so i'm going to have negative e squared plus 2t squared plus the secant of t squared squared. Oh, I get wild and crazy with my square root there. And so, and I don't know why I dropped my negative t, because I just didn't like it, I guess. And so I get the square root of, and it's gonna be negative one times negative one, so this makes it positive e, but it's still negative two to the t, because it's a power rule there. And then plus four t squared, and then plus my last one is going to be secant to the fourth of t. And that is my final answer. Now, up until now, this is pretty standard. Velocity being the second derivative, acceleration being the first derivative. But there's a new layer here. Is We are talking about vector valued functions, so we can break down our vectors in the um, ten, unit tangent vector, the uh, unit normal vector, and of course the unit binomial vector. And that's going to help us think about when we're driving on this curvy road, right? So we're driving along this curvy road and the speed limit is 35 and the entire time we're going 35 because it says we can. And if you don't turn the steering wheel as you're going along this curvy road, you're going to continue in the direction that you are headed, pointed in your car, which is straight ahead. And you're going to run off the road. And the speed which you're traveling is going to be coupled with that direction, and that's going to give you your velocity as a vector. Okay? Now, as you turn the wheel to stay on the road, because, you know, you don't want to crash, crashing is bad, your velocity acceleration vectors will change as you go around these curves. So your velocity and your acceleration, of course your velocity is the, the tangential at that moment, um, is going to change. So your velocity and acceleration is going to change even if your speed is constant because the vectors are changing position. Now that's something new. We not, haven't ever talked about that. We never talked about, hey, if I'm going along this curve, that I expect my velocity and my acceleration to change. We just said, hey, let's go ahead and graph this and show that it's decreasing or increasing. But we never really got into a good reason why we just said, oh, look at the slopes of the tangents and they're decreasing or increasing. Well, this is because if you think about the velocity as a vector, then the velocity as a vector is gonna be tangential to the curve and that's gonna, that vector is gonna be changing direction. So the magnitude may be this may be constant, but the the direction's going to change, which means the acceleration vector is also going to change. So your speed may be constant, but your acceleration and your velocity probably is not. So what ends up happening is if we look at this, now let's take a look at this car going around this corner. Here is the direction. This is the velocity vector, and this is the acceleration vector. So you notice that the acceleration vector is pointed toward the, cor the corner, the turn, and that will always happen. 
your acceleration vector will always be pointed toward the, the, um, the turn. Now, what we have here are these components of the acceleration because we're talking about a vector, which means I have an I component and a J component. And of course, if we're in the three space, I could have a K component, but we're not gonna talk about that yet. So we're gonna, we know that when we are looking at the unit tangent vector and the unit normal vector, that those two combine will give us the osculating plane at any point P along the curve. That's defined by the vectored valued function. Since T and N, my unit normal vector and my, tan my unit tangent vector, come from the derivative, which is R of T, then the acceleration vector lies in the osculating plane and can be written as a combination of these two unit vectors and normal vectors. And here is the equation right here. So our acceleration, A of T, can be wrote as the speed, the derivative of the speed, and then we have the, um, the tangent unit vector, and then we have the speed squared, and then we have the curvature, and then we have the um, unit normal vector. Now the coefficients, the unit normal and the, uh, the unit tangent and the unit normal are referred to as the tangential components of the acceleration and the normal component of acceleration, tangential component and the normal component respectively. And we write A sub T to denote the tangential component and A sub N to denote the normal component. So let's talk about this theorem. Let R be a vectored value function, cool. Then the acceleration is the second derivative, cool. Then the tangential and normal components are given by these formulas. A sub t is gonna be the acceleration vector, or dot product with the unit normal vector, which is the same thing as my velocity vector with the dot product of my acceleration vector divided by the norm of my velocity vector and my a sub n, my, my n component, my normal um, component is my a, my acceleration vector with a dot product of the normal unit normal vector, which ends up becoming the um, cross product norm, the norm of the cross product of the velocity and the acceleration divided by the velocity, which gives me also this equivalent form, and we can then relate this as the acceleration is my, my um, tangential component, which is a scalar multiplied by my um, my tan unit tangent vector, and then my unit, my normal component multiplied by the unit normal vector, because my this is a scalar. So we now have a way to write the acceleration in terms of the unit normal vector and the unit tangential vector, and we have a way to find the scalars. So remember how I said on our last video, we're gonna wait to do some of this stuff? Bam, here it is. Now, the normal component of the acceleration is also called the centripetal component of the acceleration. There's a question on the homework asking you about that. Or sometimes it's called the radial component of acceleration. If we look at our car that's traveling on, along the curvy road again, the acceleration vector always points toward the center, center of the curvature. But the, the pull that you feel, and this should be pull that you feel, is toward the outside of the curve because that sensation that you're feeling acts in the opposite direction of the centripetal acceleration. That's why, this is why roads have a slant toward the curvature as you're going around it. So if you have some curved road like this, say this is you in your car and you're going smoking fast, that's why you're in red, smoking fast in red, that this road will have a slant 
that is slanted toward the curvature. So if this is facing toward the, the curvature of the road, then you're gonna have some sort of slant. And that helps to counteract that pull that you feel as, you're, as it, it feels like you're pulling to the outside. Of course, you know, go the speed limit. So let's take a look at this. Here's your car and you're going this speed. You're going at a constant speed around these corners and your acceleration, here's your acceleration. It's, it's your acceleration vector is pointing toward the um, center of it. It's always pointed toward the, the uh, curved part, the curvature pointed inward of the curvature. And then you have your two acceleration components. So let's find the tangential and normal component of the acceleration for each one of these vector valued functions. So the first thing we're gonna to have to do is find our second derivative. To do that, I need to find my first derivative, r prime of t. This is gonna be my velocity. So I'm gonna do my derivative, and of course, I'm gonna be excited about the fact that I have the product rule on these. And so for my first component, it's gonna be e to the t cosine of t minus e to the t sine t. So this is my first component. Well, this is going to be a good time. And then my second component is going to be e to the t. The derivative of e to the t is e to the t all day long. The sine of t plus e to the t cosine of t. And then e to the t. So that's my first derivative. Now we're going to do the second derivative. So our double prime of t, which is v... Um, there's no prime on this one. So this is gonna be V of T, which is gonna give me my acceleration. And these are all vectors. Remind myself that these are vectors. This is not speed. Okay, so where we are is this. I get to do the product rule again. So I'm gonna do the product rule on this piece first. And I have E to the T cosine T. Um, minus e to the t sine t. So that is that component, or that piece. Now I'm gonna do this one, which is gonna give me negative. I'm just gonna put that negative on the outside. e to the t sine of t, and then I'm gonna have um, plus e to the t cosine of t. And that is just my first component. That is my i component. Now I'm gonna continue and I'm gonna do this derivative. So we have, this is gonna be e to the t sine of t plus e to the t cosine of t. I'm gonna do this one now, which is gonna give me plus e to the t cosine of t minus e to the t sine of t. And then I have my last one, which is e to the t all day long. Okay. Now let's do some cleanups here. I know this is kind of long. So I'm gonna clean this up and I see e to the cosine and that e to the cosine, when that pulls through, is going to make that those cancel out. So even though it looks nasty, I just have negative two e to the t sine t for my first component. Similarly, let's see what's happening here. My sine t's, e to the t sine t cancel. This one's gonna cancel, oops. Did not mean to do that. This one is gonna cancel with this one, just like when this negative pulled through, this one canceled with this one. So I'm gonna have two e to the t cosine of t, and then I have e to the t, e to the t all day long. Now I'm gonna find the tangential component. Now if you remember, my a of t is gonna be the dot product of my velocity and my acceleration divided by the norm of my velocity. So I'm gonna do the dot product of this and this. Those two are gonna be dotted together. So um, that's going to give me, when I multiply this through, I need to multiply e to the t cosine t minus e to the t sine t times 2e to the t sine t. 
And so this in the numerator, it's not a vector anymore because it's the dot product, is gonna give me negative two e to the two t sine t cosine t and then minus minus becomes plus e to the t or 2t because it's it's this e and this e so there's two of them bases are the same we add the exponents just as a reminder i'm sure you all knew that and then this one's going to be sine oh, i'm going to go in black this is going to be sine squared of t so that is that first multiplying out and then it's going to be plus 2e 2t cosine t sine t so what i'm doing now is i am multiplying this and these two okay so then we have um plus 2e to the 2t cosine squared t and then we have our last one which is e to the 2t now i'm gonna what i'm gonna do is i'm just gonna do my dot product first so i can clean it up a little bit so i'm just gonna do my dot product now the reason i'm doing the dot product first is i can see that this one and this one cancel right because i have a positive and a negative and then I have, and I think I dropped a two somewhere, and I did, and there should be a two right here. So if I bring this one and this one together and I factor out two e to the two t, I have sine squared plus cosine squared. So those two combined are gonna give me just two e to the two t plus, or times one, multiplied by one, okay? Then I still have this e to the 2t hanging out. So what I end up with is 3e to the 2t. So it looks terrible, but when I got totally done, it's not that bad. So that is my dot product right here. So I found my dot product. This is my velocity and my acceleration dot product. Velocity and acceleration. Okay, now I still need to find the magnitude of my velocity, which means I'm gonna take the square root of, now if you remember, I had this lovely yet exciting e to the t. Remember way over here I had e to the t cosine t sine t. So I have e to the t cosine t minus sine t. I'm gonna do it like this the quantity squared, I factored out e to the t. And then I have the same thing again, but with a plus. So I have plus e to the t cosine t plus sine t squared. That needs to be squared like that. And then my last component was e to the t. So plus e to the t, the quantity squared. All right, now let's do some algebra here. So I'm gonna have e to the 2t. When I multiply this through, I'm gonna have cosine squared t minus two cosine t sine t plus sine squared t. That is all of that. Now this is all underneath the square root, so I will put that on there in a minute. I have e to the 2t, power to power rule, this is gonna give me the cosine squared of t plus two, the sine squared of t. The sine of t, not squared. Squared's gonna come in a minute. Sine of t, cosine of t, plus the sine squared of t. All right, that is this. And then I have my last one, which is e raised to the two t. This whole thing is underneath the square root. This whole thing is underneath the square root. So what I know as I look at this in all of its glory, I know that e to the 2t is gonna come out. When I factor that out off of this one, this one, and this one, I am left with 
the fact that, remember these two equal one, these two equal one. So I have, when I factor out e to the t off of each one of them, I have one minus two the cosine t, the sine t, and then I have plus one plus two the sine t, cosine t. So I'll write it as cosine t, sine t. And then these cancel. So that's kind of nice. So I took something that looked terrible and I'm now down to e to the 2t and then 1 plus 1, which was horrible to begin with. Well, it wasn't horrible. It was kind of elegant in its own way. It was just a lot of writing and potentially places to get lost. So what I end up with is the square root of 2e to the 2t. Oh, wait, one more. I should have a three there, because don't forget, I got all crazy and excited here, is I still have plus one from factoring out this e to the t. So I have a one as a placeholder. So what I have then is one plus one plus one more. Cancel that. And so I have one plus one plus one more. This gives me a three. Now this was my magnitude, so I'm ready to go back to where I was before. My a sub t is equal to my dot product of my acceleration and my velocity and the magnitude of my velocity. So this is gonna be three e to the two t divided by I have the square root of e to the 2t multiplied by 3. And if I'm inclined, I can go ahead and rationalize the numerator or denominator. Yeah, let's rationalize it. So I have 3e to the 2t multiplied by the square root of e to the 2t. I'm going to squeeze a 3 in there. And then here I'm gonna have um, 3e to the 2t, and you can see that these will cancel. And I end up with uh, the square root of three. The square root of e to the 2t is just e to the t. So I have e to the t, and that is my final answer. It's a lot of work, but that is my final answer. Now, let's do this again for the a sub n, the normal component. So the normal component a sub n, a sub n is equal to the square root of the magnitude of the acceleration squared minus my a sub t squared. So my acceleration in the normal component. I don't know what that's all about. All right, so we know this value right here. We just found this, so that's not too bad. Then all we have to do is do the normal of, find the norm of the acceleration and then it gets squared. So that means that I don't have to have the square root within it. So I'm not gonna have a square root within a square root. So in other words, when I square the norm then I just have each component squared. So I go to my acceleration, which isn't that bad. Here's my acceleration. So my a sub n is gonna be equal to the square root of, and now I'm just gonna square each one of these. So it's gonna be negative two, e to the t, the sine of t, quantity squared plus 2e to the t cosine of t the quantity squared plus e to the t the quantity squared and then plus or excuse me minus my um, tangential component which was the square root of 3e to the t the quantity squared so this is gonna give me, um, underneath the square root, it's gonna be um, four e to the two t sine squared of t plus four e to the two t cosine of t squared, cosine squared of t 
plus e to the 2t minus 3e to the 2t. And we know that these two combine, once I factor out 4e to the 2t, gives me just 1. So where I am now is this is going to be equal to the square root of 4e to the 2t plus e to the 2t minus 3e to the 2t. And my final answer is the square root of 2e to the t. So this is a sub n, and this one is my a sub t. And that's it. It's a lot of work. It's not bad, though. I mean, we've done worse. So that's that part. Now I'm going to take a moment. I'm going to erase a bunch of stuff so that we can have some space to do my second question. Welcome back. Now we're going to do the same thing, but now we have cosines and we don't know, we have this omega that, and we have an A's here and we have B's here. And um, at least we only have two components. So we're going to go through this where I have this A cosine some omega T and B sine some omega T. This is in the I direction. This is in the J direction. And I'm going to evaluate it T equals zero. So let's go ahead and get started. We're first going to find our first derivative, f r prime of t, which gives me my velocity. It's not prime like I did last time. So if you're okay with it, I'm going to stay with the vector component rather than the i, j, k stuff. So I'm going to do the derivative of cosine. a is a constant. Omega will be a part of the derivative because it would be the derivative of the angle. Omega t, the derivative of omega t, which will be omega. So the derivative of cosine is sine, so it's negative a, the sine of omega t. And you know what? Since I know that I'm going to have to multiply by the derivative of the angle, I'm just going to write this as a omega. Aw, cosine, or sine, excuse me, sine of omega t. And then I'm going to do the same thing for the next one. I'm going to do the derivative of sine, which is going to be sine of omega. It's going to be cosine. And of course, multiplied by the derivative of the angle. So I'm going to get b, by the way, the sine is going to be cosine of omega t. Now I'm going to find my acceleration. So that is my second derivative of this. This is our vectors, which is the first derivative of the velocity, which gives me my acceleration vector, which now I'm going to have um, the my a and omega out front are just multipliers. And so when I do the derivative of sine, I get cosine, but now I've got another omega. So it's going to be a omega squared, the cosine of omega t. And then I'm going to have b, it's going to be a negative because of the derivative of cosine is negative sine, omega squared, the sine of omega times t. Now I need to find my dot product of these two. So I'm going to first do this one and this one. This is going to give me a positive a squared, a omega raised to the third power, the sine of omega t, the cosine of omega t. Okay. Now I'm going to do my next one. So I'm going to do these multiplications. And so it's going to be minus b squared omega to the third power. And then it's going to be the cosine of omega t and then the sine of omega t. I think I'll take a moment and possibly factor out like terms. So I think I'm going to factor out an omega cubed. And I'm going to factor out also a sine omega t cosine of omega t. And then I'm left with a squared minus b squared. And I just, by the way, if you're asking why did I drop that um, around the, the parentheses around the angle, I just dropped it for no apparent reason. Now I also need to find the magnitude of my velocity. Remember these are vectors. So I'm going to do the square root of, and it will be a negative a omega sine omega t, the quantity squared, 
plus b omega cosine of omega t the quantity squared which gives me underneath the square root a squared omega squared the sine squared omega t plus b squared omega squared the uh, cosine squared of omega t and this one's one that you should get familiar with at this point we know that if we factor out an a squared and an omega squared i'm gonna have sine squared plus cosine squared that is equal to one so what i'm left with is a squared omega squared plus b squared omega squared multiplied by one but we can also see that an omega is going to come out we can factor out an omega so this is going to be omega squared a squared plus b squared which means this is going to be omega divided and then multiplied by the square root of a squared plus b squared cool so my a the normal or the tangential component of my acceleration is going to be equal to I have omega cubed the sine of omega t the cosine of omega t multiplied by a squared minus b squared divided by my omega and then the square root of a squared plus b squared now this is going to just cancel that down to one so if you're okay with that i'm just going to erase to make my life easy and bring that down by a factor of one so that's going to be squared now and that's all i can do that is all that i can do at this point now i'm going to do my uh, normal component of my acceleration which is going to be the square root of the norm of my acceleration vector squared minus the my acceleration in my tangential component squared so let's take a look at my velocity vector my velocity vector is so this is going to be equal to the square root of i have um, negative a omega squared cosine of omega t the quantity squared plus negative b omega squared sine of omega t the quantity squared and then i'm going to subtract off this lovely thing squared so minus well, let me go back in so it's going to be minus and i had omega squared I had the cosine of omega t. It's terrible. It looked like who knows what that looked like. So it was the cosine of omega t, the sine of omega t, a squared minus b squared over the square root of a squared plus b squared. And this whole thing is going to be squared. Now, we should be familiar with this at this point. We know that these two are going to give me a squared omega to the fourth, cosine squared omega t plus b squared omega to the fourth, the sine of omega and sine squared omega t. Now, unlike our previous one, we can't do any combination and pull out the a squared um, omega to the fourth, cosine squared, sine squared. So because of the fact that I have this a squared and I have this b squared, they're not the same. I can't just factor out a sine squared and a cosine squared. So that's as good as that one's going to get. So I might be able to pull out, pull out omega to the fourth power. But where I am now is this is going to be equal to the square root of, and it was a squared omega to the fourth, the cosine squared of omega t, plus b squared omega to the fourth sine squared omega t, and then minus that other stuff I had, which was omega squared cosine omega t, the sine of omega t, 
and then it's going to be a minus b, a squared minus b squared, all over, well, I can get rid of the square root, so that gives me a squared plus b squared. This whole thing, well, this numerator still is, let me say that the numerator is still squared. Okay, now that's pretty awful. But the good thing is, and this is, by the way, this is my a sub n, so it is my normal component of my acceleration. The thing is, is that, I know we probably got lost <laughs> what we were doing. We're asked to evaluate this at t is equal to zero. So what I'm asked to do is a sub n at t is equal to zero. So everywhere I see sine, because I know the sine of zero is zero. So everywhere I put in t equals zero, so here and here, anytime I have the sine of zero, those end up going to zero. So this goes to zero and this entire thing goes to zero. So then when I do the cosine, so all I'm left with then is the square root of a squared omega to the fourth, the cosine of zero. Cosine of zero is one all day long. So this is just gonna be a, the absolute value, and omega squared. That's it. So this is one of my answers. Now, I need to go back and actually find my, um, my a sub t, my acceleration, the tangential component, evaluated at t equals zero so I can get my other answer. And again, wherever I see sine, sine of t being zero, that goes to zero. So this whole thing is equal to zero. So there's my two answers. A of t equals zero, and A of n, my normal component, is the absolute value of A omega squared. So I know it was a lot of algebra, but it's not bad. I mean, we've done a lot worse. Okay, now, let's talk about projectile motion. If we ignore the effects of air resistance, we can now consider how gravity affects the motion of an object through air. And did you ever consider where we got those equations when we talked about, let's model projectile motion with this equation when in pre-calculus or calculus one and two? Well, wonder no more, because we're going to give you how we got there. So in two space, we're going to consider in two space, we are going to consider the x-axis as being up, um, the negative being the y-axis being down and the x, the positive axis as we move forward with gravity. So we don't consider the left side of our x-axis because that's negative time. So in the English system, the force of gravity F sub G is 32 feet per second squared and 9.8 meters per second in the metric system. This is the only force that's going to be acting on the object. So we can write the resulting force as mass times gravity um, in the j direction. So here's an example. We have our initial position and we have acceleration. Now let's explore where the, let me lock my rotation again. Let's explore where the whole equations from projectile motion come from. So if we start out with our force is equal to the force of gravity then our force is mass times acceleration, which is the negative because it is pulling toward the Earth. That's why it's negative. Mass times um, gravity. So my acceleration is negative gravity. So we know the acceleration is a first derivative of velocity. So my, my velocity derivative is acceleration, which is negative gi. Now, if we take the antiderivative, so in other words, we integrate this thing we're gonna end up with negative g of t j in the j direction plus some constant. So everything's kinda of cool so far. At time equals t, our initial velocity is v of zero. So I put in zero into my velocity equation, I get it v, uh, v naught, that's what we call it, v naught, which is the initial velocity. That means my velocity at any given time is negative the gravity, so minus gravity, going pulling you down toward the earth times the time in the j direction plus the initial velocity but the velocity is the first derivative as my position so i have s prime of t is equal to negative gt in the j plus v naught if we now take the and the antiderivative in other words we integrate this we're going to get 
one half g of t because t is our independent variable so one half g of t squared and in the j v naught and then times t plus c sub 2. now at time equals zero then our we put zero in and that's our initial position and so here's our equation boom shakalaka now when we did this before we didn't talk about this as being a vector we just said hey this is this really great equation this describes the projectile motion but we never really went through it so here it is so equivalently we can write our velocity vector in terms of sine and cosine where v naught is equal to v naught cosine theta in the i and v naught sine theta in the j where i is a horizontal component and j is the vertical component which means i take my negative one half g of t squared j v naught t cosine theta plus v naught t sine theta in the j direction because i did a replacement so I end up with V naught T cosine theta in the I, and I combine like terms, and I have V naught T sine theta minus one half G T squared in the J component. The range of the projectile motion fired at some angle theta is given by this equation. The V naught squared sine two theta over our gravity in the I direction. So let's go through an example. A projectile is shot in the air from ground level with an initial velocity of 500 meters per second and an angle of 60 degrees from the horizon. At what time does the projectile reach maximum height? We are going to use this equation right here. We're going to use this equation. So this is the equation that we're going to use to set up our position vector. So we have S of t is going to be equal to our initial velocity which is 500 and then t the cosine of our angle so I have the cosine of 60 degrees the cosine of 60 degrees is going to be 1 half so let me put in the 1 half there multiplied by t and this will be in the i hat direction and then I have plus my V naught, which is 500. And then my sine of, of 60 degrees, because it's a 60 degrees off the horizon. This is going to be equal to the square root of three over two. So the square root of three over two. And this is gonna be um, then minus one half my gravity. Now this is in, um, meters per second so my gravity here is 9.8 so 9.8 and then I have t squared and this is going to be in the j hat direction so let's just clean this up just a little bit so I have s of t is equal to 500 divided by 2 is 250 t in the i hat direction and then plus and I'm going to have 250 the square root of 3 minus um, oh, don't forget, I lost my T. I need to have a T on that. So don't, don't lose your T there. And then it's going to be minus, and I have 9.8 divided by 2 gives me the 4.9 T squared in the J direction. So now I have my position vector. Now, what I'm going to do to figure out um, when it reaches its maximum height is I take the derivative of this. So V of T, which is S prime of T, and we do this component by component, just like we did before. So I'm going to take the derivative of 250T, which is 250 in the I direction, and then plus, and inside I'm going to have 250 square root of 3, because that's a do the derivative of T is 1, and then minus, oh, 9.8 comes back. Look at that, like magic. And then in the J direction. Now, the location where this reaches its maximum height is when the vertical component, which is this, is equal to zero, which means it's neither rising nor falling at that point. So I take this 250, the square root of three, minus 9.8 T is equal to zero and I solve for t. 
And when I do that, I get t is equal to 44. Now remember, I'm solving for time. So we'll do 44.2 and um, seconds. And I know I was what I was looking for is I was looking for the velocity units, so that's in seconds. So I made sure I was in seconds. So it's 44.2 seconds. We want to know approximately what the maximum height is. So what we do now is we put this t back into my original equation. So s of 44.2 is equal to 250 and then 44.2 in the i direction and then plus 250 the square root of 3 times 44.2 minus 4.9 times 44.2 squared in the j direction by hat now the one that we care about is this part because this is our vertical component. So I'm going to do that math and I get 9,566.325 meters. So yeah, kind of high. Now what time the, um, the maximum, what is the, at what time is the maximum range of the projectile attained? So in other words, I want to know when this thing hits the ground. So I go back to my position, which is the um, S of T. That's a T not a four, that was terrible. S of T, 250 T I hat plus 250 square root of 3t minus 4.9t squared in the j hat. And what we want is this to equal zero. So we want the vertical component to be zero to make it hit the ground. So we're gonna do 250 square root of 3t minus 4.9t squared is equal to zero. And I get t out, so that's nothing interesting. So 250 square root of 3 minus 4.9 t is equal to 0. I'm going to take off this parenthesis. Is equal to 0. So t equals 0, that's this one. Not helpful. And then I take this and solve for this, and I get t is equal to. So t is equal to 88.37 seconds, which is pretty much almost the double of this. It's gonna be slightly different though, so it's approximately 88.37 seconds. So that's the time it takes to um, get to the end. What is its maximum range? So once again, I put that number into my um, original function, and I end up with, in this case, I'm gonna do S, of 88.37, 250, 88.37. Let me erase this a little bit to get some space here. In the I direction, I direction, and then the 250, square root of three, dot, 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 dot. And the only one I care about in this one is this part. That's why I didn't finish writing it because I care only about this part because that is my my horizontal component and so I want to know how far out horizontally I went. I multiply those two together and I get approximately 22092.5 meters. So and you notice all this I am not having to do the quadratic equation. So all the things that we did in pre-calc 2 or pre-calc 1 when we were doing projectile um, we were able to um, not have to do the, the quadratic equation. We didn't have to do the derivative to find the x part of it and the y part of the maxima and minima of the projectile. So we get to do it this way, which is kind of sleek. I don't know, like it or not like it. So then the last part is how long is this thing up in the air? And so we know how long it's up in the air. We actually answered it right here. And so this also is 88.37 seconds. Cool. 
In this section, we're going to also talk a little bit about Kepler's law. So, Joanna's, Joanna's, Johanna, Johanna, Kepler was able to use the amazingly accurate data from his mentor to formulate these three laws of planetary motion, now known as Kepler laws, planetary motion. So the first one is the path of any planet about the sun is elliptical in shape with the center of the sun located at a foci. The line drawn from the center of the sun to the center of a planet sweeps out equal areas in equal time intervals. And the ratio of the squares of the periods of any two planets is equal to the ratio of the cubes of the links of their semi-orbital axes. What? It's this. So, we end up with these T's and R's and 4 pi squared over GM. And basically what this is, the right side of the equation, T squared over R cubed, will be the same for every planet regardless of the planet's mass. So it's reasonable to say that the ratio of T squared over R cubed would be the same value for all planets if the force that holds them in orbits is the force of gravity. So, Gal Galileo is often credited with the early discovery of four of Jupiter's many moons. The moons orbiting Jupiter follow the same laws of motions as the planets orbiting the sun. One of the moons is called Io, and its distance from Jupiter's center is 4.2 units, and it orbits its Jupiter in 1.8 Earth days. Another moon is called, I don't know what that is pronounced as, so we're just going to say this other moon, is 10.7 units from Jupiter's center. Make a prediction of the period of the second moon using Kepler's law of harmonies. Well... I can put the T2 over R3 equal to the other T2 over its R3, and that's it. So looking at my first moon, T of 1, this is my first moon, it's going to be the 1.8, and my R of my first one, which is my, where's that one, is the distance, my R is 4.2 and then I have T2 which is what I'm trying to find and then I have my R2 which is the 10.7 so what we know is that my 1.8 squared over my 4.2 cubed has to be equal to my T2 squared over the 10.7 cubed so solving for t sub 2 and taking the square root of 1.8 squared multiplied by 10.7 cubed over the 4.2 cubed, my final answer is approximately 7.32 days. Bam. That's it.